So increasingly, I have conversations that go like this, uh, talking to someone, maybe a student, and uh, they say, how long have you been working on Racket? And the current answer is 24 years. Yes, exactly. I get that kind of, uh, kind of reaction. I can tell from like a one-on-one -on -one conversation, there's a kind of a double take or a blank stare. They think I misunderstood the question. Uh, so I add a few more words, you know, back in 1995 and so on. So I'm not sure what they're thinking. Maybe they're thinking, why isn't it better yet? Um, <laughs> maybe they're thinking, how can you work on one thing for 24 years? If it's a student, that's longer than they've been alive, probably. Um, and so the answer is, well, it's not just one thing. I mean, it's all racket, but sometimes it's language design. Uh, sometimes it's more compiler work. Uh, sometimes it's building a GUI or working with GUI libraries. Uh, sometimes it's garbage collector work. Uh, sometimes it's writing documentation or building tools for documentation. Uh, sometimes it's a little bit more abstract, thinking about continuations and delimited continuations and how those can be implemented and used. Sometimes it's building a package system or working on the distribution mechanism. Sometimes, a lot of times, um, it's writing macros or working on the macro expander. Right? And um, I, get, I get to do all of these different things, uh, partly because I'm in a, an academic context. I'm a professor. Um, but it's not just that, because as I'll explain, being a professor doesn't mean you get to do all of these things normally. Um, you have to really set things up. And, and part of it is the way that in Racket we mix research and education and production. Um, and uh, that sort of colors the kinds of problems that we try to solve and the way that we try to solve them. And some of it is specific to Racket itself and the way we set up Racket, um, the way we think about programming and the way we think about using Racket. So this is pretty much the, the outline of my talk. Uh, I'll start just making sure we're on the same page about research, education, and production. Then I'll tell you a little bit more about things actually, how things actually work in an academic context, um, sort of the, the benefits and the constraints that we have to work in. Uh, and then I'll spend the bulk of the talk um, talking more about the history bracket as examples, uh, examples drawn from that history uh, about how we combine research and education and production. All right, so. Let's look at uh, this trio here. Um, by research, um, I guess this is where my definition slide would go if I had one. But by research, I mean um, looking at new ideas, new ways of solving problems, ways of solving hard problems. The most tangible result of research is a paper or a dissertation. Um, by education, uh, well, education can be many things. Mostly, I will mean classroom teaching. Uh, at a university or to students older or younger than that. Uh, it can also mean training graduate students um, and, well, giving talks at venues like this. Maybe not exactly this kind of talk, but various kinds of talks where you're just trying to, to tell people what you know. Uh, and then by production, I mainly mean, you know, the actual system building, but building something not just as a demo, but something that people can use to get other work done. Uh, and Racket does fit into that category. There are um, you know, people out in industry and, and various places that do use Racket uh, to get their work done and, and make it a part of their, their um, tool chain. Racket, I, I'm gonna explain, sits at the intersection of these three things. Uh, it's not the only project there, uh, just to name some other programming languages in the same space. Haskell, similarly, I would say. Um, puts all three of these together, uh, as does Scala. They've done quite a bit in, in all three of these areas. Um, but I, I'll, Racket is what I know, and so most of the talk is gonna be sort of oriented around our uh, Racket experience. And it's, it's not obvious necessarily how to sit at the intersection of these three things because to some degree they, they have competing needs. Um, for example, in research, where the, the whole point is to go find something new, whether it turns out to be good or bad, right? Whereas in, in production, you really want some stability and you want the good ideas, definitely. Um, education versus production are a little bit uh, in conflict sometimes because in, in a classroom setting, you want a very simple set of things to work with, right? And in production, you want a simple set of things to work with, but you need the full generality. You know, sometimes you need various bells and whistles that might get in the way in an educational setting. Uh, research versus education, again, it's kind of a researcher. You're pushing the boundaries of things and trying to explore new places, whereas 
what we communicate mostly in a classroom is established ideas. Things are definitely good ideas uh, that we know from lots of experience and that we figured out how to explain to students. And then just if you're building a piece of software you know, from a research perspective, uh, there are often just a few interesting cases, um, the hard cases or the general case, the common cases that you're interested in covering and maybe you don't care about making sure it works if there were 40,000 of this or that. Um, and in education, it's a little bit, um, you know, you have to cover a little bit more, but you can still tell students, you know, uh, just don't do that. If there's some part of your system that doesn't work well, stay in this little space and then we can talk about ideas. But in a production setting, you have to get all the corners covered um, and can't just look at the interesting ones or the ones that you would prefer to use. Since I, I will point out that I, I'm a, at a research university and what that means, the whole idea of a research university is combining the research and education part. Right? But it does not so much mean the production part. Um, so let's then talk a little bit more about how that works out. If uh, I'm in some social, um, social situation and talking to someone and it comes out that I'm a professor, then usually the person I'm talking to, it, it conjures the image of a classroom for them. They think most of my work is teaching students. Um, and then they ask, what do you do in the summer? Uh, and I point out, well, there's also the research and that, oh yeah, yeah, they, they have some ideas that, that professors also do research. But this is kind of the picture that they, they end up with. Notice that building software is at zero on my graph. That's because it's not really the kind of thing that you expect out of academia. Or, just, uh, just among most people thinking about what professors do. To, to say what my job description actually is, I have to add in a, another column to, with our trio here. That last one, um, we call it service, but that refers to things like reviewing papers, deciding what grad students should get admitted, figuring out teaching assignments, being on committees to decide this or that curriculum, and so on. So all of the things that have to be done to keep a university running, a department running, to keep conferences, uh, academic conferences running and so on. And that's something you don't really think about necessarily if you're not in the situation. But uh, if you're within a university in a department, it starts to look more like this. Uh, service is an important thing there. Um, teaching is even more important than that. And then research, well, that's the main thing. At a research university, uh, that's mostly what you're going to be judged on is, you know, it's, a, it's an oversimplification to say, uh, publish or perish, but there's some truth in that. Right? That is the main thing and the main job description within it. Uh, you won't get tenure if you don't do good research. You might not get tenure if you teach badly. Uh, and if you're bad at service, well, you make people grumpy, but uh, they'll do something to make you make up for that. Right? Okay, so that's the outside view, the inside view. Um, you notice that production was still at zero but here's closer to the way I, I run things for myself. And so you can see there's a mismatch that I'll keep talking about a little bit between you know, the way my department review things and the way I'm going to, to do things. Um, putting a lot of effort into building the software that doesn't directly contribute to either the teaching or, or the research mission. In fact, the way I think about what I do is a little bit more like this. Um, I have arranged things so that I managed to spend about half of my time programming. Um, and I do that by, you know, some of the time when I'm programming, I say, oh, this is research. I mean, it really is something that leads to papers. Or I maybe uh, produce a little bit more software infrastructure than strictly necessary for my classes. Uh, and I've even managed to turn some service jobs into programming. Right? So I've stretched the, the production uh, bar there a little bit to talk about programming. But um, this kind of increases the tension. But it's, it's, a, it's a kind of natural thing when we're also trying to, uh, to fit building useful software into this whole picture. And the reason this can work at all is because actually universities and departments, it accommodates a, a, a spectrum of, um, of people, right? Some people will have more students, uh, some people will write more papers, uh, some people will build more software, more systems in support, and some people will do more service. Right? And on the teaching side, in fact, we're pretty good, I think, about integrating the research and the teaching parts. Uh, typically, a uh, professor will teach a subject in their area of expertise. Um, so they know the established things are in the textbook. They're working on new things. And every once in a while, you do something that's good enough that kind of makes it into the canon um, and feeds into 
into what actually is taught in general, right? But it puts you in a good position to teach the material and know what's important and not important and, and keep students up to date on that. And we're also pretty good at converting students just in the classroom into researchers. We know how to go from bachelor students to master's students and PhD students, um, even at the bachelor's level, get people uh, working on research, uh, working on problems and learning how to uh, think about research problems and write papers. And also to the degree that our research produces systems, then it's pretty common to take that research and feed it back into the classroom as kind of um, mechanical support for ideas, uh, to reinforce certain kind of ideas and, and just make the, the classroom experience more engaging and, and often more realistic. Okay, so that's the, the kind of thing that we're pretty good at. When it comes to research and systems building though, um, it's not quite as established a mixture. So certainly, you know, on your CV, you can list the pieces of software that you produce. Uh, you list all the papers, you list the software, um, and it'll look something like this. A piece of software might count kind of like a paper. That's, that's sort of how it would work in my department, I think. That's true even if the effort required for the software is much bigger than the effort required for a paper. So I assure you I've not spent 24 years on any one paper. Um, but a lot of the software just kind of looks like one piece of software. And the way it's supposed to work out is the way you're supposed to get credit for that is um, the, the systems that you build and the interest of that is supposed to be reflected in your paper. So you kind of have to build things and, and organize the way you build things and the way you, you write about it so that you're gonna get credit for it in paper form. Uh, there is certainly an advantage uh, when it comes to publishing papers of working on real systems. Because when it times, comes time to send that paper off to a reviewer and your paper said we did this, this, and this for this actual system that people actually use, um, then it is something that academics care about. Your paper will be viewed more positively uh, as a result of having some connection to reality or connection to, to practice in, in software development. And that can be true whether or not it's a system that you built yourself or you're picking something up like GCC or LLVM and, and adding to it and working on that. But if you are working on the system yourself, then that means you see a lot more of it and whenever there's any sort of problem, some tangled mess in your software, um, the, uh, you know, when you have a mess or some problem in your software, uh, that can be just a pain often. But uh, you know, this kind of problem in an academic setting can be an opportunity. Great, a problem I solve and when I can solve it in an interesting enough way, then I can write a paper about it and then get good points for having it uh, be relevant to a system. In fact, uh, if it's a hard enough problem and you solve it well enough, uh, then it's some student's dissertation. You know, a few papers in a dissertation uh, and you've kept the, the things going just as you're supposed to, right? And building a real system and working on that real system provides you extra opportunities to do that kind of thing. And finally, in, um, in programming languages, we have one more extra advantage. Uh, which is that the results of our systems, when we run our systems, it's another system. Right? And that's good when we want to build tools for teaching, for example. We're working on programming tools. We have good ways of building things, including tools that students might use. Or, of course, uh, the programming system itself. Right? That's another piece of software. It's a, a classic and um, you know, well-regarded technique of bootstrapping as a way of demonstrating that your system does something useful because at least you can build your system in it. Right? And in the racket world, we take that another step forward. Any, any kind of thing we're doing, whether it's giving talks like this or writing papers, then we tend to build systems that help us do that kind of thing and we build them in racket. And in fact, we think about all of these things in the same kind of way, these are all languages. Right? So the teaching languages is a language, racket itself is a language, the language for writing document, you know, the tools for writing document, that's also a language. And for that matter, older versions of Racket, you know, its predecessors of PLT scheme and even this scheme way back, um, those are things also that we can build um, using, using our tool. And um, this fits in, this fits in our larger method, our larger message of language-oriented programming, or Really, it just as much inspires this message that we have as it, as it uh, derives from it. Um, the idea that when you have a problem, 
Um, you know, just like object-oriented programming would encourage you to cast your problem in terms of objects, language-oriented programming uh, encourages you to think about what, what is the way that you wanted to express the solution to your problem, and how do you build a language uh, that lets you express that. This is Racket's niche. If you don't know very much about Racket, we, it's big, we emphasize a lot uh, tools like macros uh, to help you easily build domain-specific language or just language extensions within a language uh, and make all of these work nicely together. And it also helps us balance our trio of research, education, and production. Because, for example, um, when we're looking at you know, balancing research ed versus education, we uh, can throw more things into our research language, but not necessarily have it leak into the student language because we have good controls for writing the language and can make that distinction. Um, or similarly between viewing it as the production language um, for education. Um, and on production versus research, to get the kind of long-term stability that you need from a language, we take advantage of our tools to be able to migrate one face of the language, one surface of the language, while still having the older versions of the language uh, available. Not just available as separate things, but all within the same framework. Because all of these different things, all of these languages, are at some level still all just racket. Right? Concretely all running on the same virtual machine, but also different libraries can be used from different languages within the, uh, within the same program. And so we have this extra little advantage of tie, for tying together our research and education and our production approaches. Okay. So that's the big picture. But now to make it a little more concrete, what I want to do is step through more specific examples inside of Racket, kind of uh, with, through a kind of historical review of Racket. So back in 1995. Uh, this was when uh, Matthias, coming back from a relatively theoretical programming language conference, said, you know, I can have more impact and be more useful to the world uh, in improving programming if instead of just writing one more theoretical paper, uh, we work harder on training students. And also that we make programming more accessible, as it can and should be, to a wider variety of people. Not just people who want to do programming for a living, but whatever they're going to do, programming and computational thinking, that can help them uh, achieve their goals better. And I know how to do it. Matthias knew how to do it. Uh, so that's where this textbook came from. And it started a, a large and particular effort um, in setting out a curriculum and training teachers how to use it. It wasn't just about the curriculum. Even uh, right from the start, it was also a tool building exercise because this is what things look like um, for our students, our beginning students back in 95. We were using Scheme inside of Emacs. And you can tell from the dates and version number, I, I took this picture a few days ago. Um, but basically, the same kind of thing can be done today. Um, the problem was, there were some problems with this environment um, where we wanted an accessible curriculum, but day one of intro programming was, here's the first 15 key bindings you need to know in Emacs uh, to be able to run things. And so that wasn't very good. And another problem also was the kind of error messages that would come out. Um, they would be in some scheme jargon and would not be c as connected as we needed to uh, the concepts that we were teaching at the time in the class. Uh, so what we wanted instead was, a, at the time, a modern GUI environment, graphical environment, um, that students could more readily start up and, and get programming with, with minimal uh, setup and minimal learning of how to use the environment. Uh, and also provide them languages that were not just raw scheme, a language intended more for production use, um, but something that was tailored to what concepts they needed in the class. Right? So that's what you see here. Uh, this error message, it turns out, is way better for beginning students than the one before. So how would you build this if you were in 1995? How would you build this programming environment? Because now we're committed to building this piece of software. Uh, you have to remember that this is just about when Java was coming out uh, publicly getting started. So while it would be the obvious choice a few years later, it wasn't the obvious choice at the time. Right? We still we wanted some high-level language, uh, practical language. Um, so what we decided to do was take Scheme, the same sort of language that we were using for teaching and for our research work, and turn it into something practical by gluing it together with uh, libraries so that we could do the GUI work and we could do the uh, environment work. 
And this is the decision that really set a lot of the other things in motion. So right from the beginning, we have the main ingredients of complementing our research. It's uh, an emphasis on thinking about the problem of education and a commitment to building something that we're going to hand to students and they're going to bash on it and, uh, and uh, trip over all sorts of errors if we don't give them a good piece of software. And um, well, it turns out that Scheme was still a little bit away from what we wanted for building practical pieces of software. It didn't have a module system at the time. Uh, so one of the things we started looking at was enriching the core scheme language with the notion of modules. And um, you know, this was some of my work about uh, how to have a module system even where we could have mutual dependencies between the modules. And also because we were building GUIs, we wanted something like an object system, but we wanted more flexibility. We wanted mix-ins where we could drop uh, an abstraction into the middle of a class hierarchy and, and instantiate it multiple times. Um, and to go with this, you know, we had all the types uh, and the theorems and the Greek, and all of that was worth a dissertation for me. Right? Um, but then as we were still trying to build uh, Dr. Racket with these pieces, uh, the way that we were describing the teaching languages still wasn't that good. So Shriram picked up the ideas from the module system and did more with it and was able to have an improved uh, unit lang system for writing down those, uh, those teaching languages. And that was worth a dissertation for him. Uh, and had our mission been to produce this piece of software for students uh, and just teach them, then we would have been done with this. Right? We would have been done with the working on module systems and confident that we had the right answer. Right, if only everyone else would listen to us. Um, but the thing that happened was we kept using our language to build more pieces of software. And as we did, we found that this module abstraction we had, it had some issues. Uh, it was really tedious to write down all the connections. I mean, sure, we could have cycles if we wanted them, but writing everything down the way we had to was, was just too painful after things got a certain scale. And also the way unit lang separated out the compile time code and the runtime code, uh, it had some good properties in terms of understanding the code, but some bad properties in terms of organization. You would have to split out your pieces this way. And uh, it wasn't very convenient for building new kinds of language abstractions that we wanted. So this led us to a different kind of module system and improving um, the technology that we had for macros at the time. So um, this is where Racket's modern module system comes from. Uh, you can see the blue and the purple mixed together. That's runtime code and, and compile time code mixed together in a way that is convenient when you get used to it. Um, and this is also where we uh, started having hash lane. Originally, this was just a, a way to avoid a pair of parentheses around the whole body of a module. But it turned out that this was a, a powerful idea of putting what language you wrote the code in at the top of the module and became one of the important things about uh, Racket's module system. So this has become, um, as we'll see, a big source of both research and practical value in Racket. And it happened because we kept trying to use our tool to build useful things, um, you know, started on, on teaching, but spurred on by trying to, uh, to build more programs still. And then once we had a module system, Things got bigger and it was good, but then as we scaled up, we discovered some other problems. Like where you have this code on the left uh, that has sent the wrong value into the helper function um, and that that wrong value is discovered much later than it should be. Now at the time, anyone writing these sorts of libraries like help, they were supposed to put in these kinds of checks, explicitly check arguments to make sure that they were okay because we had learned from, from our teaching experience how important it was to give good error messages. Um, the problem is writing all of that down was kind of, uh, that was tedious. Um, and it gets even worse if you have this higher order case where help wants a function um, and it's going to call it, but now help has done something wrong. Um, and it was even more tedious to write all these checks in your lambda. I mean, why would you call the help function if it was going to do anything wrong in the first place? Um, and yet, sometimes the libraries did do things that were wrong and it became a problem tracking down these. So, um, you know, for those of you who have used spec and similar things, you're, you're not surprised by this story at all. Um, and out of this experience came uh, the realization that we needed a declarative way of writing down what kinds of things 
functions expect and return, even higher order functions uh, like this help function. So that's where contracts came from, and that was worth a dissertation for Robbie Fenler. Uh, now, um, the next thing you think is, well, that's nice that you get better error messages at runtime that the right module is being blamed, uh, but why don't you go further? Why don't you do it at compile time with a type system? And yes, well, that's gonna be a dissertation for Sam tobin Um But the dates jumped a little bit here. I need to go back a little bit because this is a pretty obvious idea, adding a type system to a language, right? Um, even adding, uh, adding it to Scheme, and so in fact, Back in 1992, Mike Fagan's dissertation, uh, working with Corky Cartwright, was on soft typing, first soft typing system. And the idea here is that you would try to apply the same type system as used in ML and Haskell, a Henley Milner based type system, to you know, general scheme programs out in the wild, and you would be able to show that they were type safe because, of course, scheme programs are going to work, right? Um, and so, yes, you could do that some, but when you try to take this into a classroom or apply it to some code you have, it turns out it wasn't expressive enough. So take two was Andrew Wright working with Matthias Felicen. Um, and they had to enrich the type system, say, with more uh, expressive recursive types. Maybe the technical details don't matter. The point is there were problems applying it to real programs and trying harder uh, covered more of the real programs it covered. Um, I think most of the programs that were being written in the class, in the, in the, int in the intro class at the time. Right? So it was a more useful tool, tried out, um, but it still didn't scale up enough uh, to, to real scheme programs. There were still lots that didn't fit into this type system. So the next cut was by Cormac Flanagan, uh, working still with Matthias, and they tried a completely different way of analyzing the program, a different static analysis instead of Hindley Milner type system. Um, and it had this nice property that it would draw arrows to show you um, the flow of values, uh, where, why things were going wrong, not just when things were going wrong. And this was more successful than the predecessors. Um, it was useful in classes to help students understand, you know, why did the empty list flow to a place that you didn't uh, have a check for the empty list, right? Uh, and everyone liked the arrows being drawn on, on top of things, right? So that was Cormac's dissertation. But the problem with Cormac's dissertation, um, as we try to apply it to real code, the problem is it's a whole program analysis. That's not gonna work for our real code. Uh, so the next step was to leverage these contracts that had evolved in the racket system um, to serve as boundaries between the modules and now you could do a module local analysis. Uh, that was Philippe Munier's uh, dissertation. Now we're getting closer. Right? We can work at the module level um, and statically pin down some errors, but the contract system, it was never meant to be a replacement for a type system. It was meant to uh, check many uh, more interesting kinds of things and be a complement to just writing things down mostly in, a, in the untyped world. And so um, the, the contract annotations that you wanted, right? you just wanted to take some scheme programs in the wild and apply them, um, it still wasn't enough there. So that, uh, that is how we get to Sam's work uh, on typed racket. Um, with yet another different analysis, uh, occurrence typing. And this time, uh, between the different analysis and switching to a type view, um, local typing, but with the contract-enabled interaction with, uh, with untyped code, now we had something that actually worked for racket code uh, worked it in production in that sense. And in fact, many people who use Racket today um, in production settings, they use type Racket. Um, so this is a, you know, you saw lots of dissertations there, lots of research success in that sense, and a lot of moving knowledge forward uh, spurred on by the problems that we solve directly uh, by trying to build systems. Uh, so in other words, um, it was the module system that enabled the macro system, that enabled type bracket, uh, ultimately. But it turns out type bracket, because type bracket is, in some sense, just one big macro, uh, that stressed the macro system. And there was lots of problems with, uh, you know, just like we had error problems that were solved by contracts, we had the same sort of good error reporting problems at the macro level, especially for something like type bracket. And so that spurred Ryan Culpepper's work on improving the, ma the macro system with better sub-languages and domain-specific languages for writing macros. That was Ryan's dissertation. 
Uh, and this better macro module system, well, that made contracts better. Of course, contracts uh, were part of what enabled typed racket also. So we have these things that just keep reinforcing each other, um, sort of this mixture of practice and research that was reinforced, uh, self-reinforcing just like it was supposed to, right? Here's another example. So going back to the teaching side, um, the original how to design program and exercises that we had set up to go with that, um, we pretty quickly discovered the obvious thing that students like pictures more than they like checking for symbols in a list of symbols. Uh, and gradually over time, we found a way to cast the kind of programming problems that we wanted to have, right? the ones that teach good functional programming principles, um, in this setting of video games, which looks like, especially in the 90s at least, to someone who, who knew what we had then, uh, very imperative, right? You have to draw on the screen, and then you have to erase the screen and redraw over here, right? But we worked out the right kind of uh, APIs, especially Matthias working on this problem, um, for a kind of functional reactive approach to, uh, to writing video games. Um, and that proved to be a success and helped us reach our original audience of high school students and, and college students. But then others, um, Emmanuel Schanzer, um, working with Sriram and Matthias and Kathy Fizzler, um, took this and moved it to middle school. So they took the, the ideas and the curriculum and figured out how to make it work uh, in middle schools because Emmanuel was interested in, again, this original vision of making programming available to a wider set of, of people. And uh, you know, the first bootstrap, this was the middle school program that Emmanuel started, um, it was targeted at underprivileged students, um, you know, inner city middle schools and so on. Um, and they had a lot of success there, not just teaching programming, but say re the goal was in fact to reinforce algebra and other concepts using programming as a motivator. And it's one thing to see a formula for velocity, it's another one to use that formula uh, to write your program and to be able to get there using the, the techniques of writing functional programs. And Bootstrap has carried on and, and expanded, elaborated on these ideas, um, and at this point they've trained hundreds of teachers every year and reached tens of thousands of students, um, and expanded it so that they have modules to integrate into algebra class and physics class, and so on, not just have this an after-school add-on, but integrate it into, uh, into these other subjects. Um, to, to make it fit in the curriculum and, and get the students engaged in all of these subjects. And all of that was made possible in the, in the you know, long run by having the right infrastructure and iterating on both the curriculum design and the software design um, and continuing to do um, a lot of development work. So if you find yourself um, in a position to teach some kids programming and, and need to know something to use, um, instead of just guessing what might work well, I encourage you to go to bootstrapworld.org uh, and use their software, right? So you can expand your, your own development and research efforts with some teaching efforts, uh, and that's a good way to go about it. And you'll find that they've built up, again, a lot of infrastructure uh, to help support this teaching mission. Um, it was not all. Also, uh, it didn't all, always work with the, the graceful uh, feedback loop uh, that we want. You know, sometimes there's a lot of things when you're building a production system that you just gotta have to go build and there's no research that comes out of it. So the FFI, the fun foreign function interface that you know, lets us talk to C libraries, uh, that was just some work that Ellie Barzilai did. Um, the native code compiler. I have still not published a compiler paper myself, although I've ended up writing quite a bit of compilers. Uh, just because that's needed to make Racket work effectively. Um, the GUI library rewrite, you know, it used to be in C++, we changed it to, uh, to all Racket, and it seemed like a big, big, uh, big project at the time, at least it took a year or two. Um, that again, there's no research in building GUI library bindings. Uh, Neil Toronto built the math and plot library, intending for it to be part of his research, but it was just the infrastructure to support his research, and it ended up supporting a lot of other research but uh, there's a lot of programming involved there. There was the package and distribution and build systems, things that just have to be built, but the point is there's a lot of these, uh, these things that we did to make it a production system um, that didn't fit in the academic mission exactly, 
And I don't want to, uh, to overlook the contributions made by other racket users that aren't in academia, uh, like racket mode, uh, for those who do want to use Emacs, uh, is there, thanks to Greg Hendershot. And then there's one more example that's of particular interest to me, um, which was the problem of documentation. So uh, this is kind of a teaching, uh, a kind of a teaching effort because we wanted to tell everyone about how to use Racket uh, and make it more accessible from that uh, part. And, and a lot of the same skills we use in the classroom go into the documentation. It was partly systems building and research because we built not just the documentation, but a tool for writing documentation. Um, and then there was just a lot of effort. A lot of what makes the package system hard is just building and, and distributing the documentation. Um, and then finally, there was the year I spent just writing documentation, you know, using the tool uh, to rewrite all the documentation that we had. Okay, now, let me remind you of this picture here. You won't see anything that says you get a lot of points for documentation from your department. Uh, so in fact, I went a year without publishing a paper and I got in trouble. Uh, and my reward was to teach an extra class in operating systems. So I tell this story as a cautionary tale, right? Um, it doesn't just happen this balance. If you're in academia, you have to keep playing the game uh, as well as pushing your research forward by building the system that's right. Uh, so I learned my lessons and spent the next decade or so doing macros and writing papers about it. Um, and I think we got to some interesting results here about uh, scope, uh, sort of underlying mechanisms of scope and how to make that work with macros. Um, uh, and then, so we had a good model for macros, but our implementation, amazingly enough, was still in C, right? That's a stupid language to write a macro expander in. Um, but what finally pushed me over to actually converting it to Racket and making a nice macro expander was trying to figure out how to teach. Um, and in fact, I wanted to submit a talk to Strange Loop, so I, and I wanted it to be on how to build a macro expander. So I started preparing the little toy expanders and working my way up, and I got far enough, and I said, well, what's the difference between this and a real macro expander? The answer was another 25,000 lines of code. But, um, <laughs> but it was another good example of how thinking in an education uh, mode led us to a good production result. So this is what the core of Racket used to look like. And you know we threw away that bit of C code and put that macro expander on top. And that was so nice, it felt so good. Uh, we said, well, why don't we throw away the rest? Uh, so we threw it away, almost all of it, uh, and then dropped Shea Scheme in instead. Well, and filled in some gaps. Okay. So this is what the new Racket is going to look like. Now, it makes it look easy when I shuffle the boxes around on the screen. Um, but it's been about three years so far. It's getting into a place where the Racket on Chase Scheme implementation can replace uh, the original one. And this is, again, it turns out a big production effort. Um, the, there's, I'll squeeze a paper or two out of this. Um, but <laughs> sort of the irony here is this kind of thing could only be done by a full professor who has you know, shown he can do all, write all the papers and, and teach all the classes. And then uh, I, I guess I learned my lesson from the previous work and was able to take on this thing. Right, but it sort of illustrates what can be done within the limits of, of the system that I work in. Then again, uh, by building on Chase Scheme, we're sort of inheriting this whole story all over again. Kent Divvig could come up here and give a very similar talk about how in Chase Scheme they integrated production and teaching and research as well. In fact, from the Racket perspective, one of the things that makes Chase Scheme a great compiler base is the way the compiler is written in. Uh, inside, it's a bunch of very little passes that build on each other. And I have gotten to go in for Racket on Chase Scheme and, and add another little pass uh, to do something extra that Racket has been. So that nano pass really, again, came out of teaching, right? Kent was trying to figure out how to teach compilers better. Uh, and they built this system for writing compiler passes in a nicer notation that let you talk about the concepts instead of the boilerplate. And Andy Keep turned that into a real thing, and that was worth the dissertation for him. So we're building on all of that. Um, and with that infrastructure in place, we're looking to the future and shifting back towards a kind of more forward-looking research role again. Uh, we want to take uh, what we currently think of Racket and add a new, improved, better language on top of that. The language will not be called Rhombus, and it won't use this logo that I just made up. Um, but that's the project name, because we need some name. Uh, so it'll stand in here as well. 
And uh, the goal of this is to be a better language to use, but also be a better language for writing our languages. Okay. So that means we want a few things out of it. Uh, it means that, you know, in Racket we have this sort of legacy of various data structures and we want to clean that up with some better built-in data structures that are more composable in general. This is where we've expected to steal from closure um, uh, for, for years and then finally it looks like we're going to get to do this. So I look forward to that part of it. Um, and then there's another aspect of Project Rhombus, which is perhaps more com uh, controversially changing the syntax. And I know this is going to be popular here. Um, <laughs> But uh, the reason we, we need to do this is because it turns out a lot of languages don't use us expression notation. And we want to make sure that our research and our tools apply to those languages as well. And to really do that research, I hope I've convinced you now that it's important for us to be building systems that use that research. So we need to sort of dog food this particular aspect of the system as well. Right? And I think uh, that's one of the big reasons we have to go this direction. We'll see what happens with it. Um, the, the, the syntax I put on the screen is an actual proposal. Um, there are no big detractors at the moment, but experience suggests if I put it on the screen here, then I can, then I can solve that problem, and lots of people <laughs> will want to complain. Uh, if you are interested, just Google for rhombus brainstorming. You can, can jump in and, and contribute to the discussion. Right. OK, so let me wrap up here and, and tell you what I was trying to get across. Um, if you're in academia, Maybe there are some things, uh, some points of comparison you can make. If you're thinking about going into academia or wonder about the trade-offs, um, uh, I hope I've given you a little bit of insight about how things work and what the trade-offs might be. If you're uh, not in academia, but you're a consumer of products from academia, then I hope that I've given you perspective on what we have to balance when we're trying to build something that is both useful and fits into our research and education missions. Uh, and if you don't consider yourself connected to academia at all, well, as, as programmers, we, we still do a variety of things. Some days we're just building the software, but sometimes we're thinking about new and better ways to do things. Some days we need to work on how we're communicating, how we're training other people, how we're explaining ideas. Um, so even in that setting, I hope that you found some inspiration or at least encouragement um, in the story that I described for Racket. Meanwhile, we're going to keep going. We will keep turning our programming language, programming language crank, uh, generating new things um, from that. And uh, we'll see what happens next. Thank you. <laughs>